I want to uh, thank Gail and the Keene Public Library for hosting this series of Garden Talks. And I also want to host UNH Extension uh, for all their outreach programs, including this Master Gardener Speaker Series. Many of the UNH um, programs have been put online uh, this uh, spring and this summer, including the Master Gardener classes, but there are also some great Facebook Live sessions. So feel free to um, check out um, unhextension.edu and uh, you can find fact sheets, you can find programs, uh, you can call with your garden questions. Uh, today I want to introduce um, you to uh, our, our speakers, myself and Rachel Bryce. Um, Rachel's work with the Cheshire County Conservation District and with Community Garden Connections Program has done a whole lot to advance gardening and garden education in this area. So I'm really happy to be working with her today. Uh, we both have gardens out at the Monadnock View uh, Cemetery, my garden plot, uh, my cemetery plot, uh, where there is a um, community garden. And it's great to see uh, all the folks gardening out there this year. Today's presentation is going to focus on saving vegetable seeds, but the same concepts apply to flower seeds, if that's more your interest. Just a quick overview of the talk. We're going to talk a little bit about why to save seeds and seed biology, and then we'll get into strategies for uh, saving seeds. And then Rachel's going to jump in, and once you've got those seeds in your hands, what do you do with them to really uh, look at the, the hands-on techniques? And we're focusing on a beginner audience today. So if you want more information on any of these topics, uh, we're happy to share uh, more research uh, and more information. So I'm just going to um, take a minute to invite you to uh, share uh, uh, what your name is and what you're interested in about seed saving. And also to say, as we go along, uh, Rachel or I will be monitoring the chat and uh, the participants list. So if you know how to uh, raise your hand um, virtually or write a question in chat, you can do that. But we'll also take a couple breaks through the program. And, uh, and if you wanna just raise your hand on your camera, uh, we can call on you that way too. So I'm just gonna stop sharing for a moment and, um, and call on people. So. Um, let us know what your name is and um, and why why you're here today. What your interest is in saving. Um, so Leslie, I know you were here last time. Can I ask you to unmute and and start us off? Uh, sure. Well, I'm Leslie Casey. I'm actually one of Joy's uh, classmates in the Spring Master Gardener program. So I'm at the internship stage, and um, so I am. You know, I do need to get my continuing education and I have a lot to learn, but also I've been um, in my own gardening, moving toward open pollinated varieties. I find they do just as well or better than hybrids. And um, I've saved some seeds, um, but I think my success has been a little bit uh, variable. So I, I'm definitely a beginner in this. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Leslie. Um, Sue, do you wanna go next? Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Sue Weller. Um, let's see, I live in Harrisville. I have both a garden at home and then I'm part of a community garden in Harrisville with about 40 families. So it's really exciting and um, there's a lot of great stuff going on, including uh, right now we have a lot of critter control <laughs> going on. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think uh, I've never saved seeds from year to year, but I feel like every time the garden. Question the gar in the middle of this. Did I tell you before, Karen? Uh, I, I feel like it's something I'd like to learn how to do and, and also how to store them properly from, from the end of the season through the winter. And uh, that's probably the, the biggest thing that I'm interested in is the proper storage of them. All right, great. Yeah. Um, Richard, I just muted you. We heard some background noise, but if you want to unmute and introduce yourself. Hey, hey I'm sorry about that. Um, my name's Richard. I'm, I'm just a home gardener and I'm curious about the subject. I'm glad you're offering this. 
All right. Thank. Yeah, you're in, you're in good company. I think we're all kind of uh, home gardeners. So um, let's see. Is it Leah or Lee? Hi, um, my name is Leah. I'm an Antioch student, and for my internship this summer, I am garden educator for the CNDES Organic Gardens Project. And this is my first year gardening, so I'm just kind of at a point where I want to learn everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you'll learn something, I guarantee it. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so Ben Nelson. <laughs> Can't hear you. Sometimes I find when I have my earbuds in, nobody can hear me. So, um. then I, oh, there you go. I tried to unmute you. So, there. Does Should be good. Now? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so my name's Ben Nelson. I own uh, Claremont Spice and Dry Goods here in Claremont, New Hampshire with my wife. So uh, dry seeds are quite a fundamental part of our business. And uh, as we're expanding in our own uh, farm and garden production, it's a, a site of active cultivation for us. Both herbs and pulses. So you're in the professional category. <laughs> oh, that. Yeah, great. Okay. All right. So I have uh, the name L. Lee Mather. Can you unmute? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I don't even really have a garden. I just have some tomato plants. Um, I'm hoping next year to have more. Um, I came to the talk last year at the library and loved it. Um, I just, I like growing things. I just, I'm disabled and can't really do a whole lot. I'm hoping next year my husband can do me some, and make some raised beds. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to grow carrots um, and some more things. Um, I'm happy to have some, some tomato plants at least, um, but I am interested in learning. Um, this is my first Zoom meeting, so at least I succeeded at getting here. <laughs> and um, I like to learn things, um, so I'm happy to be here. Yeah. And what's your, are, are you Lee or is Lee the I, I go by Lee. Um, legally, I, you know, Lee is my middle name, yeah. so that's why I just put L. Lee. Okay. So. Well, tomatoes are a good start. That's the yeah. first seed I saved, yeah. so <laughs> good. And uh, Christina, do you want to check in? We're just introducing ourselves to one another and saying why we're here today. Okay. Hi, um, my name's Christina. I am from Florida, but I live in New Hampshire, and I'm a, really interested in home gardening um, and also uh, shrubs, perennials, annuals, that kind of thing, but really big on home gardening. I have six raised beds, and um, uh, yeah, I just want to learn more about how I can save some of my seeds from the garden and become more independent. Great. Well, welcome everybody. I'll go back to um, sharing my screen and we'll get on with the talk. There we are. All right. So, that to advance. Having trouble getting my slide to advance. There we go. So why save seeds? Um, the goal of saving seeds, um, we've all shared sort of our interests from uh, really saving things that we like, uh, as well as kind of making it part of a, a business. Um, if we save seeds from the healthiest and the most robust plants in our garden, uh, we can even develop our own varieties over time. Uh, sometimes it's just about saving a happy accident. Uh, I always have squash and tomatoes coming up in the compost and sometimes I let them go just to see what happens. And if there's something interesting there, then we might want to think about how to keep that going. It's also a way to save money um, to keep our garden going year after year without having to save seed. And um, it's uh, uh, something nice that you can share with friends if you don't need all the seeds for yourself. 
um, if you don't save your own seed, I think it's still worth purchasing seed from a seed company from your region. And as fewer and fewer Americans uh, garden, although I think this year we're seeing an uptick, we do kind of run the risk of losing genetic variety in our seed sources and in our garden plants. And having that variety is important, particularly now, as we really want to be resilient and adapt to changing climatic conditions, changing insect stress, and so forth. So I'm glad you're all here. And I hope we all take one step in seed saving this year. So let's do a little biology lesson. This is a picture of a, a lily flower, and we're gonna talk a little bit about flower sex. Um, it's not all that different than the birds and the bees talk that you might have had in other times of your life. Um, flowers, uh, like many other organisms, have both male and female parts. Lilies and tomatoes have those parts in the same flower, but squash plants often have male flowers and female flowers. Um, for a seed to develop, the flower needs to be fertilized. So the female part, that part with the stigma and the style is called the pistil. And uh, for that to be fertilized, pollen from the male parts or the stamens um, need to go into the stigma, down the style, and actually fertilize one of those ovules. Uh, so we're really getting the pollen to fertilize the eggs. Um, one of the differences between, say, having a single uh, egg or ova to be fertilized is that there often are many of these ovules, and that means that uh, you can have pollen from different plants or uh, even different um, uh, anthers in the same flower um, pollinating each of those different ovules. So you can get quite a bit of variety even within that one seed type. So keeping in mind that um, plants uh, have flowers, the flowers can be male or female um, or both, and that pollen needs to fertilize um, the ova in order for a seed to start. And then there's uh, seed biology too. So there are two important things to remember about seeds. One is seeds are living things. Um, inside every seed is a tiny, undeveloped plant, an embryo, if you will. And that tiny plant remains dormant until the conditions are just right. Beside the embryo, there are seed leaves. They're called cotyledons. And the seed leaves store food to keep the seed alive until it can produce its own leaves and manufacture its own food. If you started your own veggies from seeds, you may have noticed that the first leaves to come up, the seed leaves, often look quite different than the true leaves of the plant. So the second thing to remember about seeds is that they're the result of pollination, of sexual fertilization. So seeds contain genes from two different parents that come together. And the reason we wanna talk about this is that um, in seed saving, we wanna capture the genetics of the original plant variety so we can plant that variety again. And when plants are growing in your garden, the seeds that develop in those plants aren't necessarily going to inherit the genes we want them to, because there's lots of opportunity for other genes to get in and pollinate uh, our plants. So another important consideration with seed saving is the timeline. What kind of vegetable plants are we dealing with? Um, are they annuals, biennials, or perennials? With vegetables, we're mostly just talking about annuals or biennials. And many of our garden vegetables are annuals. That means we plant the seed, we get the flowers, and we get seeds from the plant all in one season, and then the plants die. So fortunately, a lot of the plants that we like and want to save seeds from are annuals, and that makes them a little easier for saving seed, tomatoes, peppers, pumpkins, corn, and beans. But some of our plants are biennials, and that means they take two years to go from seed to flowering plant to seed before they die. So some of the plants pictured here, like uh, turnips and carrots and um, kale, uh, take more time to get seeds from. Uh, it's kind of tricky because 
uh, they're not going to bloom till the second year and they have to go through a cold period called vernalization in order to get to that point. So if the plants can't overwinter in your garden, you have to dig them up and bring them in and put them someplace pretty cold, but still above freezing, and then replant them outside in order to get them to the, uh, the point where they will flower and produce a seed. Um, I've done this accidentally with parsnips that I just, you know, they just sort of miss getting dug up and there they were next year and I let them go to seed. But um, seed saving, sometimes we want it to be intentional too. <laughs> so um, we talked about annuals and biennials. We talked about fertilization and pollination, but there are different types of pollination. And this is also an important um, thing to know about plants because it influences whether or not it's going to be easy or difficult to get the right variety from saving your seed and knowing what kind of pollination your desired plant has can help you take the right steps to get there. Um, Self-fertilization kind of obvious that the plant pollinates itself and it doesn't need another plant involved. Um, beans and tomatoes are like this. We all talk about how important pollinators are to our crops and many of our plants are insect pollinated. But that means that insects are going from plant to plant to plant and they can transfer pollen from another type of vegetable of the same species to the vegetable that we're trying to save seeds of. And so we might need to take precautions to prevent that cross pollination. And then wind pollination is another type of pollination. And this is where the pollen just goes up in the air, uh, say from grass or corn, and gets blown by the wind and hopefully gets caught by um, the, the stigma of uh, another plant of the same type. So knowing which uh, of your um, pollination types um, you're dealing with is really important. And this is always something you can look up. Um, this table has some of the common garden plants and shows which are self-pollinated, which are pollinated by wind, and which are pollinated by insects. So if we're thinking of starting simply, we want to think about um, plants that are in that self-pollinated group like beans, peas, lettuce, um, tomatoes, and peppers. Uh, and those that are uh, cross-pollinated by wind um, mean that um, we're going to have to be careful to prevent uh, windborne pollen from landing on plants that we're trying to save seed from. Okay, another thing to think about is what are the seeds that we're starting from? Um, and seed type is really important, so uh, this is where reading the package can help. I always try to save my seed packs now. I'm not always as organized as I'd like to be with that saving, but they're all in a big heap right now in my box of seeds. Uh, so uh, heirloom seeds and open pollinated seeds are the kinds of plants that you can save seeds from and have a start at getting uh, the, the characteristics that you want from uh, year to year. Uh, heirlooms are seeds that have been passed down for generations. Um, but other open pollinated uh, varieties might be um, newer, might have been developed um, more recently. Hybrids you have to watch out for. They're not recommended for seed saving. Uh, hybrids are intentional crosses between two different parent varieties. So if you see the word hybrid or the word um, F1 on the package, you can grow those plants, but don't save seed from those plants. Um, they might be sterile, they might revert to one of the parent varieties. You don't know what you're going to get if you save those seeds. We have hybrid plants because they have highly uniform characteristics and they're often used for supermarket plants. Um, they can be more vigorous than open pollinated plants. Uh, they can have better disease resistance. They're bred for those things. And seed companies can make more money on hybrids because they're, pri um, they're proprietary. They develop these hybrids and, uh, and kind of um, put a stamp on them that says we, we own this. Um, if you're saving flower seeds, you also want to pay attention to whether your flowers are hybrid 
uh, or not. So cross-pollination, we just talked about how insects or wind might be moving pollen from one plant to another. But what's important to avoid is cross-pollination between plants of different types. So here we have two different types of cucumbers, the sort of standard uh, straight eight green ones that we like to slice up and these more interesting uh, and different round uh, lemon cucumbers. If they pollinate with each other, the seeds that you save from that green cucumber and the seeds that you save from that yellow cucumber uh, will, if they've crossed, you don't know what they're going to give you. You might get some yellows, you might get some greens, you might get something totally different, and you won't know, uh, looking at the seeds, what you're going to get. So we want to avoid cross-pollination, and we want to remember that many of the vegetables in our gardens, even though they look different, they taste differently, they grow differently, they're actually the same species. So this middle row of curbida pepo or pepo, yellow squash, zucchini, gourds, and patty pans, and pumpkins, and acorn squash, you know, to, to the, the, in the plant world, this is all one species, and so they can very readily cross with one another. If you're growing all of these and you want to save seeds, you need to make sure that you're only getting pollen from other pumpkins if you want pumpkin and other um, flowers uh, or other pollen from the kind of pumpkin that you want. So all these brassicas, the broccoli, the cabbage, the Brussels sprouts, the cauliflower, the kale, all the same species, different types, but all the same species. Uh, and then the, the carrot can also cross with um, a wild cousin, which is Queen Anne's lice, which is all over my neighborhood. So uh, we really have to be careful to prevent cross-pollination from uh, other carrot types or from uh, wild carrots if we're saving seeds. So let's talk about seed stra saving strategies. So we've we sort of highlighted some of the challenges with getting seeds to be true to type. So what steps can we take when we're growing our garden to avoid that? One is to choose inbreeder type species, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Another is to um, prevent um, insect or wind pollination and do hand pollination. Um, a third strategy is to put a lot of distance between plants that might cross. And if you have a small garden, you're a home grower, that might be really hard to do. And then another uh, consideration that we need to have is to make sure there's enough of our desired type so we don't get a lot of inbreeding. We need um, to maintain seed vigor, especially if we wanna save seeds for many years. So what are inbreeders? Inbreeders are the type that we want. Um, outcrossers are plants that are really uh, very likely to um, cross with other plants or to share their pollen freely with other plants. And unless we take precaution, we're going to have um, seed crossing. Um, to avoid that kind of outcrossing, you need to uh, really keep pollinators out by covering up the flowers or taping them shut or keeping things really far away. So for beginning seed saving, we might want to think about um, tending toward these inbreeders. So plants like peas and beans and tomatoes and peppers and lettuce all tend to pollinate themselves. Some of it's about the structure of the plant. If you look at this diagram of the pea flower on the right hand side of the slide, it's built so that the pollen and the stigma, the male and female parts, are really closed up in the petals. So it's really hard for outside pollen to get in. Um, tomatoes and peppers likewise also self-pollinate. Um, their flowers are built so the pollen is near the stigma. Uh, and lettuce and beans also are good candidates for seed uh, saving because they tend to self-pollinate. So I've just uh, started taking steps to learn how to hand pollinate squash more just to develop the skills, not so much to um, save any seeds right away. 
Um, but here's step one, two, three, four in how you would do that. Um, step one is to seal uh, both the male and the female blossoms sh shut. And maybe you can tell the difference. The female has the pink tape on it <laughs> and the little round incipient um, ovary um, or squash at the bottom of the flower. Here's the male flower with the straighter stem. And before they open, you want to tape them or tie them shut so they can't go having flower sex until you say like, okay, I'm going to help you with this. No bees or no insects allowed. Um, then when they're mature, and these flowers usually open only for a day, you start your hand pollination by uh, cutting off the male flower and taking off the tape, or you can use a clothespin or um, uh, just tie it with flagging tape like the female one. And you're gonna use that um, uh, the, the pollen bearing um, anthers on that male flower as kind of a paintbrush to go in and um, transfer pollen to the female flower in step three. Here in step three, you can see the outside parts of the female flower have been torn away to make that uh, easier to do. And then you need to tape that female flower shut <laughs> so that um, busy bees can't get in there with pollen from other types of uh, squash or other plants that would cross with the squash. Uh, and here you can see this person has neatly labeled, um, you know, what they're uh, what they're doing, the dates for this. And so then this would become a squash from which you uh, save your seeds. So as I said, I started doing this um, out in my garden. Um, I got a paintbrush and I used a paintbrush to transfer it. The first day I went out, it turns out there were only male flowers, so I was just kind of like dabbing pollen from one to another. The next day I got down on my knees with my biologist husband and we peered through the leaves and I got better at, at uh, telling the male from the female flowers. So a third thing that we want to think about is keeping enough space between plants uh, whose seeds we want to save so that cross-pollination is less likely. And you can see uh, that the recommended isolation distances are pretty um, small for some of these, like lettuce, bean, and tomato, and pretty high for others, like spinach and beets. So this is this is feet apart. So with spinach and beets, you're, you're you're getting like over half a mile apart, and that's because these are wind pollinated seeds. So this is another thing to do if you want your seeds to be true to type, is to um, keep the distance um, between them. And then a last thing is to think about how many plants do we need in order to have enough diversity of seed even within that type that we want. Uh, so for corn, for carrots, for onions, many more plants are needed in the home garden to have a robust seed, sor uh, seed source. Um, but other things like lettuce or beans or tomatoes, not so many. So that's just another thing to keep in mind. How many plants do we need? So then we get to the fun stuff. I think probably people always think about these things when they're saving seeds, which are the desirable character, characteristics. So if we know we're gonna save seeds, we wanna start by looking at the whole plant and looking at it over the whole season. Um, is it early? Is it more disease or insect resistant? How does it handle drought? Uh, is the fruit fairly uniform? And is it fairly true to type? I have some peas growing in my garden now where there are two different types of peas on, on, you know, from the same seed set. So it's like, well, that's interesting, but maybe that's not what we want. Um, look at the fruit. Uh, does it have good color and shape? Is it productive? How about the flavor? <laughs> so if you're growing uh, an area of plants for seed, you want to pull out the rogues. The rogues are the plants with less desirable characteristics. And just make sure that they're not getting their DNA into the mix. So beginner's guide to seed saving. One, select annuals that are primary self-pollinated. So if we start with annual vegetables and we start with self-pollinating vegetables, uh, we've made a good choice. So peas, beans, tomatoes, and lettuce are all plants that are annuals, that are self-pollinated, 
and they also don't require um, many plants to reliably produce seed. So I'm just going to take a break from uh, from sharing slides and see if. Uh, anybody has any questions right now? Everybody's good? All right. Well, Rachel, do you want to take it from here and start to talk about what do we do once we get those seeds? Um, sure. Thank you, Joy. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to circle back um, to a couple of the things that Joy mentioned during her section. Um, one of the things that Joy shared was a picture of isolating squash um, by, by taping it up and mentioned that there was a label on that squash with the date and the variety. And that's very important throughout the gardening process, whether you're planting a seed in a pot or transplanting something into the ground or if you're in the process of seed saving you may think that you will remember that you put um, the dinosaur kale in the third row on the right i from personal experience can tell you i'm almost certain that you will not remember um, and that's why labeling is is so important um, and so when i label i like to put the the variety of the plant especially if it's something very specific if if it's a named variety um and i i want to remember that this is a particular heirloom um i make sure to write out the name of the variety and i write the date um, and so that's important throughout the process and I, I just wanted to mention that and then um another thing that uh, Joy mentioned was the wind pollinated plants. At the end of the talk, we'll provide you with some resources that are um, really useful if you want to go more into depth in this in this subject. And one of the topics um, that's covered in, in the resources is how to physically isolate a population of plants if you can't get the distance. So if you're interested in saving spinach seed, for example, and you cannot guarantee that you can keep them 3,000 feet away from other spinach plants, there are methods to deal with that. And so if that's something that you're interested in, those types of information will be included in, um, in the resources at the end. So I just wanted to follow up, follow up on those couple of things. So I'm going to walk you through a few different ways to save seed and timing for doing that. And then... Um, for folks that, that were able to get your hands on a tomato, um, we can do some interactive stuff together and, and otherwise I'll just um, show you some stuff to do with, with tomato seeds in particular. So let me see if I can share my screen. Zoom isn't my natural habitat, um, so bear with me. Okay, so can everybody see um, a slide that says seed saving techniques. Ah, wait. There. So can everybody see? Um, great. I see some nods. Um, and if you do have questions, again, feel free to type them into the chat and Joy can manage the stack um, and go through those with you. And so for seed saving, um, there are a few, um, diff actually two different methods for saving seed. Um, there's what was called the wet seed method and the dry seed method. And I'll talk to you a little bit about um, how each of those work and which of the plants like each of those um, methods. And so dry seeds are the ones that are probably easiest, most simple, and they're one of the processes that happen naturally in your garden. And so if you're a person that has been gardening for a couple of seasons um, and you notice that, oh, hey, I didn't actually plant chives this year, but there the chives are, um, those are one of the dry seeds. And so that also includes things like peas and beans and peppers and corn. Um, with these, you want to let that fruit mature on the vine or mature in the garden, if at all possible. Sometimes it's not. If, if you're edging on towards winter, 
and you know that the weather is going to be very wet or if there's going to be a freeze. Sometimes you need to cut that plant and bring it inside into a dry place with good air circulation to store. But ideally you would let those mature and fully dry in the field. Um, and that also includes things like basil. Um, these are some basil seeds down at the bottom. I mentioned chives, so anything in the allium family, if you allow it to flower um, and dry in the field. Or lettuce, um, when people say their lettuce is bolting, it'll send up a flower stalk. And so those two are seeds you, you would want to let dry and mature in the field. And then when they're dry, um, whether that's inside or outside, you can start the process of separating the seed from all of the surrounding material, the dry flower petals and the pods and the bits and pieces of stems. And so there are a couple um, steps to this process. The first is called threshing, and that's when you physically detach the seed itself from all of that surrounding plant material. Um, some threshing is very easy and simple to do, like when you're working with large seeds like peas and beans, especially on a small home gardener scale. And so, uh, for example, this person in the picture is separating out dry beans from the bean pods. This is something that when I'm saving bean seeds, I like to do in, in the winter months because I can just put a great big empty bowl in my lap and put the basket full of dried beans next to me and sit and watch a movie while I thresh the beans out. Um, so it, it can take some time to physically do it that way, but it, it can be enjoyable. Um, the smaller ones can take a little bit um, more time and care, but again, you can usually do it with, with your hands if you're working on a small scale. And then as you increase in scale, uh, maybe for example, Ben who's here um, in a, his professional capacity, there are different methods and different equipment um, varieties that you can use to sort of increase the efficiency of threshing on a, on a larger scale. And those resources that we'll provide you can give you more in-depth information about that. And then after you thresh, you then have to winnow. And winnowing is essentially um, using air currents to separate out the seeds that you want to keep from all of the materials you don't want to keep or the chaff. And traditionally, doing the, the winnowing, um, you may have seen in movies or seen pictures that people might have these big seed baskets and they're tossing it up into the air and, and the wind is blowing it. Um, that's, that's a way that you can do it. You can do it with your own breath you can have um, a number of containers like, like this person and pour from container to container in front of, of a fan. But essentially any time you're using air to separate chaff from seed, um, that would be considered winnowing. And then another, another way you could do this if you don't want to use the air or if the seed is very light and could blow away, you can physically separate those things. Um, using window screens or colanders, even flower sifters, um, essentially any method you can find to separate that seed from that chaff. And so different types of plants um, will have different sort of seed saving methods, either whether it's wet or whether it's not wet, um, whether it's dry. And they also have different times and indicators of when it's time to harvest. Um, so for things like tomatoes and peppers, ideally you would pick those at, at their prime. Um, you would want to get them at their most ripe. Um, for things like squash and watermelon, you may pick them when they're ripe, but they actually will continue to mature as they rest. And so for a squash, maybe you pick it and you let it sit for another week or two in your house. Um, but things like cucumbers or zucchini, <coughs> excuse me, eggplant, peppers, they need a little bit more time for the fruit to mature. Um, similar to those dry seeds that I mentioned at the beginning, like the peas and the beans and the lettuce, um, they need more time to mature on the vine before the seeds will be ready to um, process and store and plant again. And so if you would let these crops grow beyond the time that they would be enjoyable to eat. Um, 
So cucumbers and zucchini, they'll change color, they'll change texture. The skin or rind on the outside will get very hard, so you can't poke it with your fingernail. Um, Eggplants will change in color. They'll get um, some, some yellowing to them, especially the kind of eggplant that has um, any white in its pattern um, will get significant yellowing and it too will get tough. Um, peppers, you can let them sort of shrivel and dry. Although some, some peppers have a tendency to mold on the inside, so you kind of have to know your pepper. And then in order to get them out, um, it's not too hard and most of us have at least done this um, seed removal process from squash. If, if you've ever cooked squash or if you've ever made a jack-o'-lantern, um, it's the same process. You just scoop the seeds out physically. Um, and then for these seeds, and I'll, I'll show you some, some pictures in a little while, you use water to clean them. Um, for, for things like tomatoes, um, this is what what we'll do together, you will you squish out the, the seeds and the pulp into a container and, and I'll talk more about what happens next. And then with um, eggplants or with peppers, just you just use your fingers to separate out um, those seeds from the plant material. And so this is one of the ways that you begin the process of processing uh, wet seeds like the squash family. Um, once you have scooped it out of the fruit, then you use um, first your hands to get out any big chunks, um, run it under cool water. You want to soak it. And that can help for about 24 hours. Um, one thing that you, you don't want to do is to soak it and let it dry and then get it wet again. So once those seeds are dry, you want to keep them dry. Um, otherwise that can um, interfere with their viability or can encourage mold to get into your to your seed. Um, and the mold is another reason why it's so important to, to clean your seed because any of this pulp that remains in the seed once you've decided to dry and store it can be food for, for bacteria and fungi and yeast and you want to remove that as much as possible from the seed um, before you dry and store. Um, so this is, this is actually the process that, that we're going to do together or that I'm going to show you how to do. And it, it, this is all about saving um, tomato seeds. They're one of the easiest and kind of fun because it's like having a science experiment in your kitchen. Um, the first step is to, to squeeze out the seeds and the pulp physically into a container and then a labeled container. And then you, you let those ferment. Um, they will tend to get mold on them and that's okay. It doesn't affect the viability of the seed. It does um, smell unpleasant. So if, if you decide to do this, just to be aware that it does have an odor and that that's normal. And then once it has fermented, it usually takes about three days depending on the temperature and the place where you're storing them. Then you can start to wash and decant um, and then to, to strain them out. So that was really, a, to me, it felt like a lot of information. So I, I just want to check in. Does anybody have any questions or, or clarification at this point? I'm seeing some head shaking and no one's unmuting. So I'm going to assume that everybody's good. So I'll go back. Um, another, okay, good. yes. Um, once the seeds have been washed, separated from the pulp that surrounded them with tomatoes or with cucumbers, once it's gone through the fermentation process, then it's time to dry them. Um, you'll want to, if you're not using a, a screen, you'll want to use something like a paper plate or a coffee filter. Um, more papery things like paper towels aren't as ideal because that they can stick to the seeds. Um, you want to make sure again that they're labeled and they need to be in a place that has good ventilation so that they thoroughly dry. 
Um, you can check on the bigger seeds um, or the smaller seeds if you're really dexterous. It, if they snap cleanly, then you know they're dry enough to store. But if they still feel soft and pliable, they need more time. I do have a question, actually. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm allergic to mold. Yes. Um, do you actually have to do that? Is there any way you can do the seeds without doing the mold thing? Ah, the, so the tomato fermentation. Yeah. Um, some folks have skipped the fermentation process entirely and mm -hmm. simply um, rinsed and washed and then dried the tomato seeds. And that can work. You may have decreased germination rates with your tomato seeds because they have evolved um, to, to need that fermentation process to remove the gel that surrounds the seed that actually acts as a germination suppressant. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means that your, your germination rates might be decreased. Another, um, another piece of information that I could give you about that question is that um, if you can get somebody else to handle um, the decanting and washing uh, right after the fermentation process, you can, after that has happened, you can make a really dilute bleach solution and soak uh -huh. the seeds in it um, for, a, for a certain amount of time. And again, that's in, included in some of the resources at the end. You can soak the seeds in a dilute bleach solution and then uh -huh. rinse, and rinse, and rinse, and rinse and rinse and rinse to get all the bleach out. But at that point, you'll have removed um, you'll have greatly decreased the, the risk of, of you coming into contact with mold. Does that help? Yeah. Thanks okay. for the question. Thank you. Um, so you wanna make sure they get super dry before you store them because if you store them with any moisture, that too can increase the chance that a mold or fungus could uh, take up residence in your seed store. So you can either use um, silica gel packets, which are, uh, fairly easy to find online. Um, you can also use powdered milk. Um, so you can make a little packet with um, a paper towel or a tissue and some powdered milk and put that into the glass jar with your seeds. Um, seeds that are completely dry, that are stored with a desiccating agent like silica or milk, can be stored in the freezer. And that can, in fact, um, increase their viability for a year. There are some seeds that can live in the freezer for a decade, um, as long as they're dry. Um, so just keep that in mind. The drying is really important. Okay. Um, and again, to make sure that you label with the variety and with the date, right. um, keep your seeds separate, keep them dark, um, try to avoid temperature fluctuations or moisture fluctuations, if at all possible, um, that will um, increase the, the viability and the life of your seeds. And so, so we have some time, which is great. I'd, I'd like to sort of walk you through um, the physical process of the tomato seeds. So out of the folks who are here, was anyone able to procure a tomato? Shaking head shaking head, shaking head. Joy has a tomato. Um, so that's fine. You can do it later on your own if you want, but I'll, I'll walk you through. Um, and I, I don't have a really um, sophisticated uh, setup here. So can you see a cutting board with a bunch of stuff on it? Is that, is that yes. visible? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so what I have here are, are a few of the parts of the process. Um, so the first thing that you need if you want to save tomato seed is, is a ripe tomato. Um, and this, I, I went out and picked it from my garden. It's not, um, it's not an ideal exemplar because this tomato you can see has, has some splits. Um, so maybe it's, it's one of those indesirable characteristics that, that Joy mentioned. On the other hand, we got an inch and a half of rain last night, um, and tomatoes will split if they're um, very thoroughly watered after a period of dry. So it could just be physical. Um, so I have a tomato, I have a knife, 
I have a jar that you may not be able to see the writing, but it's labeled with yellow grape and the date. Um, and so tomatoes are super easy. You just um, cut them open and it's, it's this pulp that you want, the, the gel with the seeds on the inside. And so you just um, use your fingers to get that gel with its seeds into your container. The rest of this, you could just eat it, which I'm, oh, that's really good, which I'm going to do. And if I had had more tomatoes that were ripe, I would have gotten you more, but this is all I have. Um, so if you're seed saving, you are probably um, using a whole bowl of these tomatoes to really fill up the jar. You don't want to dilute this gel with water or other liquids. Um, it needs its sugars in order to ferment properly. So that's the first part. And then you put a lid or a cover like cheesecloth, um, something to keep dust and bugs out and just set it aside um, for about three days, depending on how warm your, your kitchen is. Um, mid 70s, is a really ideal temperature. Um, little warmer just means it goes faster. So, so here are some that I started um, a few days ago and you can, can maybe see that there is mold in there. Um, that's fine. It's normal, it's what happens. If you had filled this jar, you would then need to find a bigger container because you want um, at least three or four times the amount of space in order to do the washing and decanting. So I'll try not to make you dizzy, but I'm gonna move this computer. Okay. Now you should see a sink. Um, I'm not gonna smell it. I am gonna get some water in there. Um, so once there is water in the jar, you can use your hands or another implement um, to just stir it up. And I'm going to just scoop out the mold. I definitely don't want that. The viable seeds, I know this is cloudy. The viable seeds for tomatoes, not all plant species are like this, but for tomatoes, the viable seeds will float, sink to the bottom. And anything that may have floated um, would not be viable. So you can just um, carefully pour off the liquid. While, while leaving those seeds in the jar. And you want to kind of um, do this a few times so that they're clean. It also helps to have a little strainer. Um, this is just a colander I use when I'm cooking in my kitchen. It's not fancy equipment. Um, but you, you pour the seeds, once they've been rinsed, into the colander, and then you can use, at that point, your fingers and running water to get any last remaining goo off of the tomato seeds. Um, and using your fingers like that won't hurt them. They, they can take it. So then, don't get busy. Can you see the great? I have um, just a plate, and this is a coffee filter that I cut up and labeled with the variety and the date. And I'm just going to um, put those seeds onto, and they, they will stick to you.
and spread them out as much as you can. Um, over the next couple of days, you know, you kind of want to use your fingers to disturb the seeds a little bit so they don't stay all clumped together. But now that they're on here, I'll just store them um, probably on a little shelf that's around the corner and um, come and check on them, you know, every couple days, stir the seeds around till they feel really dry and then I'll put them in a jar and store them. And so that's the tomato process. Um, so just wanted to remind people that um, we've um, got plenty more programs uh, coming up. We have a talk on climate change and gardening in two weeks uh, with Sandra Pickering. Um, she was in the class with Leslie and I, so this will be one of her uh, internship projects. Uh, and it's kind of a twofold emphasis on climate change and gardening. One is how climate change is impacting us as gardeners and how to adapt to that, but also how as gardeners we can help to mitigate climate change through the kinds of cultural practices that we use. I think it'll be really interesting. And then uh, August 20th, I'll be back in my um, solo run on putting your garden to bed. So it's, it's a little bit early, but um, you know, sometimes uh, we need to wrap up before school starts and it's always kind of good to know what are the things you need to do because um, most of us can't start our gardens in one day and we can't put our <laughs> gardens to bed in one day or we just, uh, um, you know, do ourselves in. So I hope you'll join us for both of those. They're both on Thursdays at 11. You can register for them now uh, or anytime up until right before the, the workshops. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank you again.